Uh, and with that, we'll introduce our next speaker. Um, we have Priya McKinsey from the University of Toronto in Canada, and she'll be presenting tumor-derived exosomes and immune dysfunction in the tumor microenvironment. All right, Priya, you are, whenever you're ready, you're good to go. Great, can you hear me and see everything, hopefully? Um, all right, so as Aliyah mentioned, my name is Priya Makijani, and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto in the Department of Immunology. I work in Dr. Tracy Begaha's lab at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center, and today I am very happy to have this opportunity to share my work with such an international audience. So the project I will discuss with you today involves looking at the interaction between tumor-derived exosomes and myeloid cells within the tumor microenvironment in a model of pancreatic cancer. So so pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, or PDAC, is our model of choice for a few different reasons. Firstly, it has a very poor mortality rate of 93%. As you may know, this costs us very important people like Steve Jobs, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Aretha Franklin, just to name a few. This this poor mortality is due to a recalcitrance to traditional cancer therapies, including checkpoint blockade. Just to remind you, as you may have heard many times in this meeting, checkpoint blockade has been a blockbuster therapy for many different tumor types because it's able to turn on a T-cell mediated immune destruction of the tumor. The reason this doesn't work in PDAC is thought to be due to a immune suppressive tumor microenvironment. And this is a picture, a depiction of, of uh, simplified depiction of the tumor microenvironment, you can see there are many different cell types at play that create that suppressive microenvironment. In PDAC specifically, there's a very large infiltrate of myeloid lineage cells. Myeloid lineage cells include dendritic cells, MDSCs, myeloid-derived suppressor cells, neutrophils, and macrophages. There's a wide heterogeneity of phenotypes within each cell type, within each immune cell, uh, and the field, uh, many groups in the field are trying to understand this heterogeneity. In our group, uh, in our lab, we're interested in, in macrophages. Macrophages, um, specifically TAMs, uh, as well as their mechanisms by which they modulate immune suppression in the tuber microenvironment. So macrophages are a highly plastic cell type. They respond very easily to signals in their environment. And in the past, we have understood macrophages using in vitro systems and infection, acute um, models like infection and injury. And we have understood to them in this past, in the past, and in a binary polarization fashion. Either you have an M1 macrophage, which expresses genes that produces effectors that, pro uh, that promote uh, immune responses, for example, T cell activation, or we have M2 macrophages, which are suppressive macrophages that could block T cell activation uh, and promote uh, regeneration in, in a wound healing phenotype. However, as we understand macrophages uh, more deeply and in the context of chronic diseases, like car cardiac hypertension, rheumatoid arthritis, and, and cancer, we understand that the macrophages actually exist in, a, exist in a continuum between the M1 and the M2 phenotype. This makes it very difficult to classify which one is a pro and which one is an anti-tumor macrophage. The field is also, on top of this, as Anthony mentioned to us, is appreciating that each of these phenotypes is context-dependent in the particular tumor or tissue that you're looking at. And so my goal in this work is to understand understand one specific type of tumor-associated macrophage, which is the CD169 po a positive macrophage within the PDAC TME. So as we all know, macrophages are the most phagocytic cell type of the immune system. To achieve this ability, they have a range of receptors, some of which are shown here, that, that allow them to take up foreign particles and self particles. CD169, also known as iloadesin, is one such receptor named for its ability to bind to glycoprotein, so, so sialic acid residues on glycoproteins. Among other functions, the CD169 positive cell and the CD169 receptor has thought to be involved in the uptake of small particles. For example, it's been manipulated by HIV for entry into the cell. And more importantly, most importantly for me, it has been shown to be required for the uptake of small extracellular vesicles like exosomes. So brief overview of tumor-derived exosomes. We know that 
Exosomes are produced by live growing tumor cells and their biogenesis summarized here relies on the functions of genes like NSMAs and RAB27 A and B, which are targeted for depletion, for exosome depletion in experimental models, including mine, as I'm going to show you. We also see uh, that there is an increased concentration of exosomes in PDAC patient plasma compared to healthy donors. This is also true of breast and colorectal cancer. Tumor-derived factors have been shown in vitro to be able to regulate uh, exosome contents and, and um and levels. For example, the KRAS mutation, which is characteristic of PDAC, the interferon on hypoxia signature found within the tumor microenvironment are thought to be involved in this dysregulation of exosome levels in cargo. There are many groups that are trying to investigate this unique cargo signature of exosomes to serve as a liquid biopsy biomarker for the early detection of uh, pancreatic cancer um, and, and looking at all the different cargo uh, molecules that are found in exosomes. For example, we find TLR ligands like DNA and RNA, cytokines like TGF-beta, uh, as well as MHC molecules and self-antigen. However, my work is looking at the role of tumor-derived exosomes within the tumor microenvironment where, where they're produced and we find the highest concentration of exosomes within the tumor microenvironment, specifically in interaction with the CD169 positive uh, tumor-associated macrophage, which are, which are, as I've shown before, uh, said before, they are specialized for the uptake of small extracellular vesicles. So this brings me to my hypothesis. We predict that CD169 positive macrophages in the tumor microenvironment take up exosomes, and this uptake leads to a response that produces a pro-tumor inflammation and supports tumor Tumor progression. So I start with a in vitro model, a simple in vitro model. I use a cell line that is derived from a spontaneous mouse model of PDAC, which represents the mutations found in most patients. I isolate exosomes from cell culture supernatants and find using nanoparticle tracking that they are about 100 nanometers in size. They also positive for classic uh, tetraspanin biomarkers of exosomes, and they have this classic cup-shaped morphology, as you can see here, by transmission electron microscopy. So I use these preparations to to treat bone marrow-derived macrophages. These macrophages are a model system to understand what TAMs might be doing in the tumor microenvironment, and they also all happen to be completely CD169 positive. So to test this response in model macrophages, I use a qPCR uh, analysis, a simple qPCR for RNA transcripts for, of both M1 and M2 effectors. I treat macrophages with exosomes and also in the background of GMCSF. So this mimics tumor bearing conditions as we know that GMCSF levels are higher in PDAC patients than healthy donors. And also that GMCSF is thought to potentially of macrophage responses. And that's exactly what we see. So for example, with IL-6, we see that exosome treatment leads to increased IL-6, uh, upregulation of IL-6 transcript, and this is further potentiated in the GMCSF response, uh, sorry, in the GMCSF background. We see that there's a unique response. So some M1 effectors like IL-6, TNF-alpha, and IL-1 follow this pattern. However, other M1 effectors like interferons do not. The same is true for M2 effectors. For example, arginase, which is is a key component of, um, of inhibiting T cell proliferation. Um blocking T cell proliferation, we see that there is a response to exosomes. However, IL-10, another M2, classically M2 cytokine, uh, shows no response. And we will further investigate this using, uh, using some bulk sequencing. So to understand the role of CD169, I take this in vitro model, as I showed you before, and use a CD169 knockout. So using the bone marrow drive macrophages, you can see I'm able to knock out CD169. And then I use labeled exosomes, labeled using CFSC uh, type of uh, type of dye like CFSC that binds only to membrane bound proteins, and I show that in the CD169 knockout is not as efficient as taking up ex at taking up exosomes as the wild type counterpart. And together, uh, coinciding with this lack of uptake, we see that, or this reduced uptake, we see that there is a reduced response of the genes as part of the signature. I am continuing to do this work with other other genes and and repeating it using ELISA for protein levels. So this all doesn't matter if there are no CD169 
positive macrophages in the tumor. So I take this and, and study this using a mouse model. So we have the KPC spontaneous PDAC mouse model, uh, sorry, that cell line that we derive from that mouse model and put it back into the pancreas in an orthotopic injection. And then I allow two to three weeks for outgrowth. And I look within the tumor microenvironment to understand the CD169 TAM. So we see within the total CD45 immune infiltrate, we have TAMs marked by CD68 and approximately 20% of those TAMs are CD169 positive in this mouse model. I also see it by, you know, uh, by immunofluorescence microscopy here. And then using the knockout, you can see the knockout uh, knocks out CD169. And then when I allow tumors to grow in the knockout conditions, there is a significant reduction in tumor weight. There's a trend towards the reduction in spleen weight. However, I need to repeat all of these with a larger N number of mice. But what's interesting is the arginase signature. Just to remind you, arginase was one of the uh, M2 effectors that came up after exosome treatment, comparing wild-type TAMs in the tumor microenvironment uh, that are CD169 negative to do those that are CD169 positive, we see there is a higher level of arginase. And when we knock out CD169, uh, this level uh, remains much lower. What is also interesting that within the tumor microenvironment, generally levels of arginase seen by flow cytometry are much higher than in the spleen, where we also expect CD169 positive macrophages and exosomes to be, to be having an effect. So in order to determine the direct line between exosomes, uh, CD169 and immune suppression, I am continuing my work using a couple of different mouse models. So first I have a cell line that I use that is knocked out for RAB27A, just to remind you that was a key part of exosome biogenesis. I knock it out using CRISPR and again I see a trend towards a reduction in tumor weight and what is also interesting is that there is an increased immune infiltration and a reduction in the myeloid to lymphoid ratio. This ratio is a, a kind of a crude ratio that can serve as a prognostic and, and you can see there are more T cells within the tumor microenvironment than, than, uh, than myeloid cells. And so the further goals with this particular model is to sort out the CD169 positive macrophage, compare them uh, with and without the exosome cell line and, and see what that signature is uh, and, and whether or not we can we can recapitulate what we saw in vitro. I also use another mouse model, which is a CD169 Cre-driven arginase knockout. So we would have arginase that's knocked out only in CD169 positive macrophages. And there too, I see a trend towards tumor uh, weight reduction uh, and an increased uh, total number of T cells. So I will further dissect using these tools, uh, the role of CD169 and the response to exosomes in the, in the PDAC microenvironment. And again, this all doesn't matter if this macrophage is not involved, if this receptor is not involved in the human, uh, in the human situation. So I use the TCGA data set, which is kind of, to, to use this analogy, you used a lot so far, there's a fruit smoothie. So we take a bulk sequencing of about 100 different patients and we plot high and low expressing um, tumors on a Kaplan-Meier curve. So we find that on the y-axis, we have the probability of survival. And in the pink, hopefully you can see this, in the pink, we see high expressors, in this case of CD169, have a lower probability of survival than low expressors of CD169. This is also true of RAB27B, which serves as a prognostic with a huge difference between high and the low uh, expression, uh, as well as arginase. And so this is a fruit smoothie. So we, if we look at, at, at uh, understanding one fruit at a time, and then I re to achieve that, I reanalyze this data from a Chinese study that looks at 24 different uh, pancreatic cancer patients, PDAC patients, and I reanalyze them using a simple SERAT analysis, and I find that yes, there is a myeloid cluster, and within that myeloid cluster, we do find CD169 or Siglic1 positive cells, and although these these cells don't cluster like the computer generated clusters here, we find that they take on a unique, uh, unique part of these clusters. Uh compared to marco-positive cells. So marco is another cell surface receptor uh, that is thought to mark M2 macrophages. So I will continue this work to, to understand the signature of CD169 positive macrophages compared to other uh, TAM subtypes.
So this brings me to my conclusion summary slides. Hopefully I've uh, convinced you that CD169 is required for the uptake of tumor-derived exosomes. And this uh, uptake uh, is, sorry, this, this response to exosomes can have pro-tumor effects, including the production of IL-1 and arginase uh, that leads to a TAM-driven tumor progression. And there are many therapeutic opportunities that come up as a result of this model. Firstly, we have cytokine blockade of IL-1 as well as arginase inhibition that are already in the clinic for other cancers. We have preclinical modeling of exosome inhibitors. And unique to this work is this idea of a CD169 blockade, which is already being investigated by some groups uh, to reprogram the CD169 positive macrophage. So with that, I thank you all for listening. I hope you enjoyed what I had to share. Uh, and if there are any questions, I would be very happy to answer them. Hi, Priya, thank you for that awesome presentation. Um, I actually do have a question. Uh, so given that exosomes are derived from cells, can you touch on some of the challenges that the field faces in using exosomes for therapy? Okay, so that is very different from the work that I do, but yes, exosomes are, are um, used as a therapy. So you can actually use exosomes and the fact that macrophages take up these ex exosomes really well to reprogram those exosomes. However, and also there's other, other applications like people use the self antigens and exosomes to turn on DCs in the presence of an adjuvant for an exosome DC uh, sort of, um, sort of um, vaccine. So, but the issue is that um, you would have to get exosomes from that patient uh, and, you know, because it, it, it's the same as cell therapy, right? Because it comes from the cell. So it has to be specific or it'll be rejected or you have an immune response to, to, to clear that. So there, there are a few issues. I haven't, to be honest with you, thought about the clinical applications of exosomes and therapeutic applications. I, I, I work on understanding the basic biology of what exosomes are doing in the tumor microenvironment. But certainly it's very interesting to think about uh, the ways in which this can be, this can be used in the clinic. Awesome, thank you. Priya, I have a quick question. It means you're going back to your slides, unfortunately. That, where you reanalyze the Chinese data and you looked yeah. at um, CD169 and, and Marco and you said they were distinct. Didn't look distinct to me. Uh, um, okay, I, I, do, I do have something. So there are, let me just go back to that slide. And you're, you're correct that they aren't completely mutually exclusive. But um, what we find is that there are, of course, Marco CD169 co-positive cells, but there are also CD169 Marco um, independent cells. And so further analysis, hopefully you can see my screen now, uh, would, would involve, you know, kind of just dissecting that. And as I mentioned to you before, there's no one marker in it, you know, of the M1 versus the M2. We're just trying to understand the heterogeneity and it would be fine if there were, there were two that, that kind of coincided. So thanks for correcting me. They're not completely mutually exclusive. There are, uh, there are co-positive cells, uh, but you can see that take up kind of two ends of the cluster. Uh, thanks a lot. Any other questions? Uh, yes, you got another question. Um, you mentioned inhibiting exosomes. Do you worry about interfering with normal cell-to-cell -cell communication? Yeah. I do. <laughs> you, you know, unfortunately for cancer patients, a lot of these treatments are not very specific. You want to block MYC, you block all of the functions of MYC. And, and that's the, you know, unfortunately the situation, even with PD-1 blockade, it's not very good. You turn on um, cardiac autoimmunity when you, you treat patients with PD-1 blockade. So, so uh, we would like to get a very specific uh, response and in a, in a way that exosomes are producing way more exosomes, although that's a little bit controversial of a statement. Some people don't believe that, but, but a lot of people in the field believe that the, the reason we have high levels of exosomes in the tumor, uh, in the patients is because there's production by the tumor cells. Uh, and so you'd be able to block that and, and create a clinical, you know, outcome. Um, but yeah, that remains to be seen and more, more testing needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, all together, amazing presentation. Thank you for sharing. Thank you very much.